Well, good morning, friends. Hey, this is uh, Brother Mike back on the uh, podcast. Thank you for uh, tuning in. It's Christmas morning. And I'm coming to you live from Oceanside, California, uh, hardcorechristianity.com. I'm from the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. And uh, yesterday, it was my privilege to have been in on a service. I was teaching at the Carlsbad Community Center, and the Holy Ghost blew the windows out of the service. Literally every person that attended the service got a touch from God. It was amazing. Uh, Everyone at the service except two people got delivered from demons. Four people got their gift of tongues. So we're grateful for the moving of the Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the one and only. And the broken body of Christ and the blood of Jesus, we want another one by God's grace. If you need to get a hold of me, you can contact me on email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. You can call the Arizona Deliverance Center if you are in need of uh, counseling or deliverance. We have a counseling staff there in Phoenix, and you can come for uh, personal prayer and counseling or deliverance. There's no charge for born-again Christians. Also, uh, we have two live services every week, Thursdays and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. Both those services are broadcast live on our YouTube teaching channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Also, we have two live deliverance services on Zoom every week. Tuesdays and Friday, Tuesday and Wednesday night at uh, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. The uh, live services Thursday and Friday are at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. The Zoom services, you can just send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, and I will send you the code and the password for the uh, services. Let's take a hard target look at God's Word today. And uh, Take a look at the most powerful and the most important parable Jesus ever spoke. As you know, it's called the uh, parable of the sower. It's in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, both, all of them have this uh, parable listed. And it's really remarkable because it explains 50% of how the gospel is exposed to humanity. It explains 50% of it. The uh, parable of the sower uh, illustrates the word of God and how it affects different type of people. And uh, the parable of the sower assumes that the word of God is presented appropriately and truthfully, just like Jesus would have presented it. The flip side of the coin that the parable of the sower doesn't illustrate is false teachings, false doctrines, such as prosperity or word of faith or things like that. The parable does not focus on the gospel and how it's presented inappropriately. It only focuses on the gospel on how it's presented appropriately. And that's the parable of the sower. So let's get into it for just a couple of minutes. As you know, uh, there's four grounds to the parable of the sower. One of them is the wayside. The other one's the stony ground. The other one is thorny ground. And the other one is good ground. Four types of ground, four types of listeners, four types of receivers. And the first ground, as you know, the wayside, that's that is the word of God that's thrown out, illustrated by seeds, and it lands on, you know, the street or the road. And it has easy accessibility to the devil. A person who is a wayside type listener is someone who hears the word, number one, and number two, they don't they don't really understand it. Uh, Number three, they don't actually get born again. Uh, The word comes to them and they 
they see the preacher, they, they hear God's word, but it doesn't register enough with them for them to get born again. They never get saved. And the fourth thing that happens on the wayside, Satan, through demons, immediately comes and steals the word from them. And where does he steal it from? Their heart. It says it's stolen out of their heart. The word of God goes into the person's mind. Auditorily, they hear the word of God. But the demons steal it inside, from inside. They go inside the person and they pull out the word of God and it becomes useless. Now, the second type of ground, as you know, is stony ground. That is ground where the listener receives the word of God and they're thrilled about it. They're so happy. They can't believe it. They see it as good news. They see it as a relief. They see it as an opportunity to have a new life. And the person gets saved. They turn their life over to the Lord to become a born-again Christian, but they don't believe for very long. They never develop a powerful spiritual root into their spirit, man, and they get attacked by the devil. Everybody who first gets saved uh, has this similar story. You know, after I got born again, I was so happy for a while, and I felt so relieved, and I was so thankful, but then everything started to go bad. Everything started to go wrong. And the person that Jesus said, they start taking offenses. They become offended at other people. They become offended at God. And it's really, the whole thing is a gigantic trick. It's the devil pouring persecution on them and trials and tribulations, trying to get them to abandon their faith. And guess what happens? It works. They abandon their faith. They take an offense. They collapse under the pressure. They don't understand spiritual warfare. They don't have a proper uh, support group and mentoring group to see them through. And well, guess what happens? It becomes unfruitful. It goes to the third ground. The word of God then falls on thorny ground. Okay, and this is similar to the stony ground in that the person believes the word of God gets down inside them. It got inside them going down into the stones. It got inside them going down through the thorns. And they hear the word of God, they believe the word of God, and they go forward. They start to make progress, and they're doing well. But, but the devil then attacks with fear and anxiety. And fear is Satan's most powerful weapon. It's like a whip on a horse. It's how you get the person to uh, behave. It's how you control the person. And the devil brings in the big guns of fear and anxiety, and they love pleasure. They love the good things in life. They are not comfortable about sacrificing anymore. They collapse under the delusion of money and material things. And the word is choked out. And their fruitfulness turns to bad fruit. And the bad fruit then becomes, they become unfruitful. And they give up, they backslide, they quit, and they don't produce any more fruit. But here's the good news, and now I'm talking about you, hopefully. Some of the word of God falls on good ground, and the person hears it and understands it, Jesus said. And they open themselves up with a good heart. And they start producing good, solid, honest fruit. 
and they become very productive. And every person then, where the seed falls on the good ground, produces at a different rate. Jesus used an example, some 30, some 60, some 100, different level. Everybody produces at a different rate, but the bottom line is they're producing. You produce at 20, you produce at 30. Hey, that's great. At least you're producing. In the other three grounds, the person did not have any long-term continuous fruit. And so each person's productivity depends on that person. And the Jesus explained that the fruit is generated under patience and endurance. Producing fruit for God is a very difficult thing to do. It's very hard. And it requires your greatest skill. You know what that is? Patience. You have to have patience in order to produce Holy Ghost fruit. There isn't any other way to accomplish it. It's not possible. It has to be through endurance and patience. The Greek word is hupomone. It means endurance. See, Christianity is not a sprint. It's a long-distance marathon. And the only way to be a marathon runner is you have to learn how to pace yourself. You have to learn how to overcome adversity, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation 3. You have to learn how to stand your ground and survive when the going gets tough. you got to be an overcomer. You've got to learn that every Christian, without an exception, has to face enormous adversity. You have to face adversity. Usually, it's involving two things. Relatives, close friends, and your health. The devil will use these things to attack you, your parents, your siblings, your spouse, your health, and he will do everything and anything to stop you. And without patience and without endurance, you'll never survive. You cannot survive. Most new born-again Christians, most of them, backslide at least once. And the reason for that is they never developed any patience. They never developed any endurance. But the good ground receivers, the good ground listeners, they do develop patience. And in your patience, possess ye your souls. Your patience is the key. The good ground and only good ground yields disciples for God. Christians are a dime a dozen. They're all over the country, and most of them are spiritually useless. Literally, absolutely useless. Because God never called you just to be a Christian. You are always called, Matthew 28, to be a disciple. Disciples don't collapse under pressure. They don't backslide when the going gets tough. They don't go back to the pleasures of this world and the pleasures of life. They don't do that. What happens is they go on to maturity and they go on to becoming a disciple. A disciple is completely different from a Christian. All disciples are born again Christians. Very few born again Christians are disciples. Almost nobody makes it. And as Jesus said, the reason they don't make it is because they don't have any patience. They don't develop patience. You have to develop patience in order to be successful at anything in life. You have to in develop endurance. You got to be able to stand under pressure. 
and that takes trial and error. People who are good ground Christians, they are individuals that don't take no for an answer. They don't collapse every time somebody moves the table. They don't fall apart. They don't turn on other people. And most importantly, as Jesus said uh, in Stony Ground, they don't take offenses because offenses are the number one downfall of a born-again Christian. But disciples don't take defenses because they know who their enemy is. The enemy, your enemy, Ephesians 6, is not other people or your relatives or your friends or the co-workers. No, far from it. This is a spiritual war. Christians don't see that. They don't understand it's a spiritual war. That's why they call them carnal Christians. The Greek word is sarx. A carnal Christian lives out of their emotions. A disciple lives out of their spirit man. Their spirit man is the main focus of their life. A carnal Christian lives out of their emotions, their soul, and they become soul man Christians. And that's why they don't survive. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground were all Christians who never went on to become a disciple. And they stayed living out of their emotions. And they became carnal Christians, fearful Christians, Christians with anxiety, Christians who are scared. And they don't go on, Revelation 2 and 3, to become overcomers. Overcomers. They don't do it. Once you become a disciple and you're a good ground Christian, every good ground Christian knows that this is a war, a spiritual war, to the end. Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation 3. Jesus said several times, he that endures to the end will be sozo. Greek word sozo, delivered. You'll be saved if you can endure to the end. And three of the four grounds did not endure to the end. They were gone. They were lost. The good ground Christians realized you have to endure to the end. And a good ground Christian knows that born-again Christians can miss the rapture. Oh my gosh, Brother Mike's a heretic. No, I'm not. I'm just somebody who can read. Born again Christians, most of them will be entering the tribulation. They will miss the rapture. It's going to be horrible. Whether the rapture is at the beginning of the tribulation or the end, doesn't matter. They're still going to miss it. Brother Mike, where did you get that information? How do you know that? Well, in Luke chapter 21, Jesus revealed it. Uh, at the beginning of the chapter, he goes through all of the end time prophecies. The prophecies about Jerusalem and the fall. The prophecies about the tribulation, the Antichrist, and so on. Then he says, the judgment of God is going to fall on humanity during the tribulation. And then he throws this in. Check it out. Luke chapter 21. Verse 34, this is after he explains all the prophetic events that are coming in the future. He then says, quote, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. Now let's break that down for a second. Drunkenness doesn't need to be broken down, right? That's the Greek word methe, where we get our English word methamphetamines. Okay, drunkenness is obviously a sin. But the sin of the drunkenness is that it takes you away from the Word of God, it lowers your defenses, and it blocks your sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not quench the Spirit. 
Well, drunkenness and drug usage obviously squashes it. Surfeiting is the Greek word for surfeiting there. Uh, Krepele, it means to party, people who are partying. Why do people party? They usually party to get away from their miserable life, or they're celebrating the sin of their life. So they're partying. And then Jesus said, the cares of this life are the third leg on the table that collapses. Maramnao is the Greek word, and it means the anxieties and fears of living. Bias is the Greek word for life there. It means the anxieties and the fears of life, living life, doing life. And Jesus said, do not be overcharged with these three pillars so that the day will come upon you and you're unaware. He said, for as a snare, it shall come on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Okay, He's talking about the rapture here, the whole planet. Pagis is the Greek word for snare there, and it means a Stepping on a trap you did not see coming, you fall in and you never saw it. You didn't see it. You dropped. Bang. And if your hearts are overcharged with partying, fears, anxiety, uh, drugs, alcohol, if you're overcome or overcharged with those things, you are not going to see this. The rapture is going to come and the disciples will go. The born again Christians will be left behind. Luke 21, 36. Let's go another verse. Watch therefore, Jesus said, and pray always. That you may accounted, be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Escape what? What he just went over in the beginning of Luke chapter 21. First, he talks about the fall of Jerusalem, and then he goes to the nightmare of the tribulation. If you want to escape the tribulation, Luke chapter 21, you have got to be good ground. Good ground requires you to, to develop faithfulness, patience, and endurance. You have to do it. See, a born-again Christian fears failure. They're embarrassed by it. They're humiliated by it. They're shamed by it. A disciple doesn't see failure like that. A disciple embraces their failures as a learning experience. They embrace their failures and their losses, seeing them not as pitfalls, but as stepping stones to victory. Victory. And Jesus warned us, listen, do you want to escape all these things that are going to come? You want to hear the trumpet? Do you? Okay. Fears of this life, anxieties of this life, intoxicants, partying, revelry, all these things are going to grieve the Holy Ghost. They're going to quench the moving of the Spirit in your life. And you're going to miss the trumpet because you never became an overcomer. Not being an overcomer was a characteristic of the first three grounds of the four in the parable of the sower. Disciples understand that your failures in life are your Best friends. Losing leads to victory. 
born again Christians don't see it that way. They are overcome by it. They go with sadness and sorrow, misery and shame and humiliation and embarrassment. And they just sink. The thorns get them. The sun burns them up. The birds, the demons steal them. God never did call you just to be a Christian. That's, that's not the gospel. No, it is not. It doesn't say that. Matthew 28 says, go into all the world and make disciples. Disciples are winners because they can endure hardship, because they have patience, and because they don't take no for an answer. They don't take no for an answer. They go on to win. Yeah. I had a service yesterday, and, you know, I, I knew it was Christmas Eve, so I knew that, you know, it was risky. Maybe nobody would show up. Thank God some people showed up. And 100% of the people that showed up got a touch from God. What was I doing there? Well, I was being patient. You know? I was being patient with endurance. I did it knowing that you know it, it could have gone bad. Hey, I didn't care. I just went forward. And the Holy Ghost showed up. And man, it was really something special. I've never had 100% of people touched by God in the service. I'll take that back. I had one about a month ago. I went to the healing cathedral in Phoenix. We had 100% of the people that showed up there, got touched by the Holy Ghost, 100% of them. All of them got delivered. It was quite amazing. But in order to accomplish becoming a disciple, you first have to become a born-again Christian. And, but you can't stay that way. You will not stay that way. 2023 is almost upon you. You can't do 2023 like you did 2022. You can't do that. That's not, that's not going to work. There's no way. It's just not going to work. And you're not going to do it. You know what you're going to do this year? You're going to open up a can of whoop ass on the devil. You're going to pour it right down his throat. Just like that. Boom. You're not going to take his crap anymore. No, you're not. No, you're not going to be laying around on the road where the demons come pick you off, the birds get you. That's not going to happen. Not in 2023. I don't know if you've been watching the news at all. I don't know if you've been keeping up with life at all lately, but the United States is going right straight to hell in a porcelain handbasket. The devil's made his move now, and he's going to overrun us. And he will overrun the Christians. There's no doubt about it. Many churches have already caved in. They caved into the pandemic and the vaccines and the quarantines and everything that went on. They just folded. That's typical for churches loaded with Christians. They folded a drop of a hat. There weren't any disciples that folded during the pandemic. They're not going to fold in the future either. <laughs> They're not going to lose. They, meaning you, you're not going to lose. That's what's going to happen to you. 2023 is by far going to be your best year.